The Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum located in Weston, West Virginia is a haunting reminder of what mental health treatment used to look like. Constructed in the mid-1800s, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum was a staple of the community for over a hundred years. The asylum was originally designed to house the mentally ill and actually provide them with a day-to-day -day routine that was supposed to be good for their mental health. But over the years, it became a place marked by overcrowding, questionable treatments, and many reports of abuse. In this episode of the Cauldron Convos podcast, we are going to be discussing the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, its rise, its fall, and its subsequent haunting. Dun, My dun, name dun. is Zenu. And I'm Kayla. And we are Cauldron, Cauldron Convos, Convos, baby. I mean, lunatic is a, is a derogatory term. I think of Looney Tunes. Looney Tunes. Well, calling somebody Looney Tunes is no lunatic good. based on the moon, Luna. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Because they uh, howl at the moon? Latin lessons for me. Or is there just that guy that lives down the street for me? If you are new to this channel, we post every single week here on the Paranormal Spine Chilling true crime topics that you definitely want to hear about so make sure to subscribe if you're into any of that stuff also we do youtube lives a lot um we post shorts so make sure to do that and if you're a subscriber and you want some more from us make sure to pay 2.99 just 2.99 a month for our monthly membership asylums have this obvious i think for me at least they seem the most haunted out of all of the places like that's what i would be most scared to go and go into like an abandoned one well if you think about it people in there usually don't want to be in there unless you're like trying to get out of a murder and then they plead guilty like because of insanity and then yeah. they go to the asylum probably better than prison i don't know but usually it's not a happy place no, but it's actually interesting because not everyone at this lunatic asylum was checked in because they were having, you know, actual mental issues. Sometimes women were just dropped off by their husbands because they were annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> I feel like the threshold to be mentally like insane back in the day is way lower than it is now. Mm -hmm. I feel like nowadays they just hand you pills and be like, all right, bye-bye, smell you later. So since this asylum has gained a reputation for literally torturing people and the immense amount of suffering that the patients had to undergo, including thousands of lobotomies, people think it's haunted. To this day, there are tourists that go there. It's actually opened up by a woman. Um, after years of it being closed, and she turned it into a little paranormal thing. Yeah, and I don't know about you, but I was always into the Ghost Adventures show and all those stupid travel channel shows, and we met all those people that were on them, and I'm like, wow, you guys actually suck. But I used to watch those shows, and just growing up, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Sound was just like a staple of the mm. travel channel. Did you know that it sits on 660... 666 acres, the property. The number of the bees. And there are 13 buildings in total. <sighs> Sorry, Taylor Swift. Take a hike, baby. I like that number, too. But you're not Taylor Swift. No True. you ever be. <laughs> okay. So the psychiatric hospital was used from 1864 and was closed in 1994 by the government of West Virginia in the city of Weston, which I don't know where that is. I'll tell you something. Something interesting is 94 wasn't that long ago. So the hospital was constructed in the late 1850s to 1881, and it was originally designed to house 250 people, 250 patients, and I believe including the staff that stayed there and slept there as well. I feel like by modern numbers, that's pretty small small yeah but they you know they did eventually end up housing over 2,400 oh. people by 1950 oh, God. so which means it was so overcrowded not enough space for people to i love the government they're so good at taking care of people the asylum's design was originally influenced by something called the Kirkbride plan, which was named after the psychiatrist Thomas Story Kirkbride. So basically this plan campus. that he had, the campus, was to provide a therapeutic environment for mental health patients. So you think that would be good, combining a psychiatrist and an architect to build a place where you put mentally ill people. Well, yeah, so they designed it, right? There's a linear building layout. The wings extend from a central administration building. So the whole point of this was to promote natural light, fresh air, to give it that, you know, nice feel instead of like a dark dungeon-esque asylum that you would see in like the movies or like American Horror Story or whatever. The By one the way, with Leonardo great... DiCaprio. What? He's where not he's... in that? No, where he's in the asylum, but... He's oh, the actual, he's a cop, oh. but he's actually the patient. That's crazy. Oh, Shutter Island. Crazy movie. Now, this is kind of 
weird, and I, I feel like they're overthinking this, but the Gothic and Tudor architectural elements were intended to convey a sense of dignity and respect for the patients. Obviously. Like, <laughs> what? Like, what What wouldn't be? Like, I guess like a gingerbread house. Type. <laughs> no, honestly, <laughs> that'd be kind of cool. Hansel, Hansel and Gretel house. Hansel like, and Gretel. And they enter through the oven. So the construction was originally done by prison laborers. I'm not sure if this was always the case. I mean, it kind of makes sense why they would use prison laborers. It's free. It's, like, it's free. Ten cents a day. Or just cheaper. Yeah, exactly. But then they had to eventually bring in stone masons or, yes, skilled stone masons from Ireland and Germany. Yeah. Which, who knew that that's where they would bring them in from? Like, there was no one in the United States that could do that. Think about it, dude. They build those badass True. buildings. I just feel like it's expensive to bring them in, and then they like had no money, and then they had to close shop, you know, because they were overcrowded. Well, I think it's very government esque <laughs> yes, to spend yes, yes. all of the money in the construction and none on the treatment. Yes, it was. It's actually <laughs> one of the largest hand cut stone masonry buildings in the United States. A little fun fact: I don't know which one is the large. Actually, it, I think it's a government. Bu- I don't know. Maybe I'm lying. Classic. So construction was eventually interrupted by the Civil War. They resumed construction back again in 1862. And the first patients were admitted in, by just some chance, October of 1864. I love it, October. Let's go, October, spooky. October, spooky month. Uh-huh. And all of the first nine patients were women. <laughs> Very progressive. <laughs> or I guess... No, the opposite. Oh, I and tried. The, and they actually have the records of the people that were admitted, the first nine patients. They probably have like a lot of the records, but at least for the first nine patients, these first nine women, they were admitted into the asylum for a few reasons. Okay. One of them was asthma. What? what which? What? Excuse I me? I bet you could cure it with a lobotomy. <laughs> okay. But here, here, there's more. Number two, laziness. I would have been. You would have been a long time ago. I would have. You'd be gone. Egotism, and you would have. You been would gone. also be. No, no you would, you'd be double, double dog. You're double dog in Tala right yeah. now. And domestic troubles. Tala, baby, you're going. And even greediness. <laughs> By the way, it's only two ninety nine for a membership monthly membership to the jail. <laughs> So because they were kind of just accepting people for all of these crazy bunk reasons like laziness, domestic troubles, whatever, basically a husband could drop off their wife and be like, we're having domestic troubles, even if the domestic trouble was like he wanted to have an affair with someone else and wanted to kind of get rid of her. And they probably just take the husband's word for it. Unfortunately, so. The good um, old days. <laughs> yeah, but because of this, this led to an overwhelming amount of people being checked into oh, the hospital, a uh, shortage of beds, shortage of staff. You get the picture, okay? It wasn't pretty. This wasn't even that long ago. It's like 100 years ago. I know. How did we progress so much? The early treatment philosophy, which was supposed to be, I don't know, represented by the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, was the principles of moral treatment. The patients had a structured routine, including farming, arts and crafts to promote their well-being, fun activities instead of just kind of sitting in a room watching TV all day. You know what I mean? Well... Trying to do engaging stuff. I think you'd be hard pressed to find TV in the 1800s, but. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, speaking of the 1900s, now let's get into the 1900s and what happened there. So, a 1938 report by a survey committee organized by a group of North American medical organizations found that the hospital housed, quote, epileptics, alcoholics, drug addicts, and the Charleston Gazette basically published in 1949 a series of reports where they were reporting on the unsanitary conditions of the place. So in I guess what year is this? 1949. The series of reports that was published in the Charleston Gazette in 1949 basically found a lack of furniture, lack of lighting, unsanitary conditions, especially in one part of the asylum. And for some reason, the other part of the asylum was kind of great in great conditions um actually i do know why because it was rebuilt using works progress administration funds following a 1935 fire the fire was started by a patient creative maybe their whole like point was to like get a new they're like this is this these conditions are disgusting i want my own yeah but think about it no bathroom. way they give you anything remotely flammable nowadays they pro- knowing them back in the day they probably had their own matches i mean yeah i think about like all the staff would probably smoke in cigarettes you know put their I matches don't know if down that was prevalent at that point yeah Maybe. The lack of the proper care and the lack of sanitation actually led to a number of deaths at the asylum, which is kind of That's wild. Terrible. 
not, you know, natural death where someone, you know, just grows old or they're sick or whatever. This was because they were neglected for so long. This asylum was the home for the West Virginia lobotomy project in the early 1950s. In the 1980s, they finally decided to reduce the number of patients in there because of the poor sanitation and the, you know, lack of care for the patients. They found that patients were locked in cages sometimes just because you know staff couldn't control or watch or whatever some of the patients and they just had so many that they resorted to locking them in cages it's interesting i read online that a lot of the neighboring areas like relied on the institution for the like local economy mm. like a lot of people worked there a lot of yeah. people were treated people there just locally and wow. uh it's interesting to kind of see that. I don't know. I saw somewhere that the, the staff were actually like kind of mistreated. I'm sure not all the staff. I'm sure some of the staff were the ones being like abusive to the patients. I think most staff is probably mistreated but everywhere. But they weren't allowed to leave the asylum. Like they <laughs> lived there and they just couldn't go anywhere. Yeah, like so they like were like the patients. <laughs> what? It's like the people making iPhones. <laughs> oh, they do? Yeah, they live in the same building. That's wild. It's really screwed up. And they have like nets and stuff jesus the eventual closure of the asylum came by court order due to a lawsuit filed by one of the patient's family members so bye 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 now that we went through the kind of history of the trans allegheny lunatic asylum let's get into the actual life inside the asylum what they do on a day-to-day -day basis let's just kind of get into more of like the what patients what the diagnoses they had were um what issues they had whatever issues as in like pro not issues not mental issues <laughs> like <laughs> no i mean like things like that there were eight patients living in a room at a time <laughs> like those kinds of issues the Let's social see, issues the... that they had to deal with well, I guess. no but probably, they probably all had social issues well not like so, so <laughs> environmental issues environmental That's issues what I meant. okay some of the mental illnesses that the patients at the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum had were things such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, other psychiatric disorders, as well as behavioral disorders. So people exhibiting behavior that was considered socially unacceptable or disruptive, even if not necessarily indicative of a specific mental illness could be admitted. So if you're just, I guess, behaving inappropriately. Yeah, they had a whole wing for like people that flash people. Oh, I know they were like, they, they, they sex addicts, right? Yeah, with, like the flashers. Well, not just flashers, but... <laughs> I'm kidding. That was a joke. Now, oh, I thought like <laughs> I thought the whole wing, whole they were just flashers. all flash. Honestly, like if, if they... <laughs> yeah, their uniforms wanna... were just trench coats. <laughs> <laughs> if they want to flash people, though, at least put them with the other flashers so they could they could get a taste of their medicine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like This is what you feel, people feel like. They're all just, imagine walking through there and you just, like a, the staff, just everywhere you go, there's someone, ah! <laughs> No wonder they were in cages. <laughs> no. Sorry, you have to cut that out. They probably had to tie a belt, like, so they couldn't undo it, like, really do tight. Do that belt dance. Oh, that stupid TikTok dance. <laughs> or... Yeah, the one you showed me. You should do that on a YouTube shorts page. The patients also had developmental disabilities. So individuals with intellectual disabilities or cognitive impairments were often admitted, sometimes due to a lack of understanding or appropriate support in society. So at this point, you know, they didn't have schools for, for disabled yeah, people. Yeah, people, people develop differently. And it's like you smelt it, you dealt it. If you I wonder if people with like ADHD were Probably, like oh, sent man. here. But some people were even just admitted for social issues. Okay, here we go with the social issues again. I guess this is what social issues means when they say it. Um, poverty, homelessness, or being deemed a burden to their families. In some cases, people were institutionalized for reasons unrelated to mental health, but rather as a form of social control. People were admitted because of substance abuse problems. Women could be admitted for reasons related to perceived hysteria or conditions associated with gender norms of the time. Many patients had to sleep on the ground. Sometimes there were eight patients living in a room all together, which is crazy to think about. The bed linens were often unwashed. The AC and the heating, you can, you know, you can imagine in this place wasn't working properly most of the time. Some patients were naked, confined to bathrooms with feces smeared all over the walls. All the staff had to stay on the grounds and couldn't leave. You said that, yeah. Yeah, I know, but I'm just reiterating. I was just, I don't know, saying that right after the feces thing. I was like, they should have time to clean it up though. 
If they're not allowed to leave. <laughs> there was a deaf and mentally handicapped male patient named Charles. And Charles was a pretty friendly guy, but he ended up being put in a ward with two aggressive roommates. They decided to beat Charles for being too annoying. They tried hanging him with a bedsheet onto a pipe. They would lower him several times when he would pass out and do it all over again. So just constantly choking him out and until he passes out and then you know doing it all over waking him up and doing it again they decided to try something else to i guess murder him they made him lie down they placed an iron bed frame on his head and the other one jumped on the bed while the other one held him down which you know obviously pierced his brain and he died um, what a creative way to kill somebody <laughs> who Come think on. like that's such a sick thing to think that of. is so fucking messed up so that was one of the murders that took place there there was another murder of a nurse by an unknown person her decomposing body was found Found two months after her disappearance at the bottom of an unused stairwell. Two months. You'd think that they would have, like, if one of the staff was missing, they would have had, like, a search party. You should probably look in that. every stairwell. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, you'd think you would go through every single place. And there were multiple fires sent by patients, like we mentioned before. And there was one patient that killed another 11 patients in total. In addition to the lobotomies that we talked a little bit about earlier, there were other medical treatments that were just crazy. For example, they did hydrotherapy, which were water-based treatments, electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, and as we said, lobotomies, and a bunch more. But a lot of them are outdated, unethical, and obviously no longer used for the treatment of Electrotherapy, people. they just zap you. I think they still use they electrotherapy. They do it, but it's not the same as what they were doing no, here. No, this is just like... <laughs> I think they would put it here. Lobotomy is where they insert an ice pick into the corner of the eye, and they go boop, 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 with a hammer. Boop, boop, boop. Boop, boop. and then they remove part of your brain and, and it's supposed to it i guess make you not insane like they would say back then but instead it would often just lead people to be vegetables and like have no personality at all or can do anything basically. very famously one of jfk's sisters had a lobotomy it's no longer practiced. I think the last one was done in the 90s. The last lobotomy performed in the United States was 1967. Now we're in the mid 20th century and obviously we have the civil rights movement and, you know, we're trying to fight for the civil rights of Everyone. the mentally ill. This era was referred to as the institutionalization. That's a hard word to say. Where it was a movement advocating for the closure of these large mental institutions that were inhumane with these crazy treatments, unsanitary conditions, transition to a more community-based care. So now let's talk about some of the paranormal aspects of the asylum. The real reason why we're all here. Yeah, this is considered one of the most haunted places in America. If you Google top 10 haunted places, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum is one of the top ones. And it's very interesting because you can go on paranormal tours. We got to do that. Yeah, we should. We, we should gotta, do a blog. We got to force Dale Wood to take us to to west and west virginia west and west virginia another area of the asylum that a lot of people say is very haunted is cell block d which this section of the asylum was specifically used for the criminally insane and the conditions within the cell block d are reportedly harsher and unforgiving That's more terrible. unforgiving than others i feel like oftentimes the concept of ghosts are souls that can't find their way home mm, and true. if you're going to like the criminally insane cell block in the institution that's where you're going to find that especially that they were treated so poorly and there's also said to be a ghost of a nurse that walks around in the asylum um, apparently she wanders the halls and some visitors claim to see a woman in a nurse's uniform and she's often described as appearing distressed or sad and the identity and backstory of this alleged nurse remains unclear though it's probably the one that was found <laughs> After two Dead months at the bottom of the stairs yeah. two months later Yo. so despite the asylum mostly housing adults i don't know i guess they did house some children there are stories of hearing the laughter and voices of children within the building i think just children are oftentimes portrayed by these spirits because mm -hmm. i feel like children are very unsettling for people mm -hmm. yeah. like i would be way more scared of a child ghost than an adult ghost because a child ghost could also be deceptive and be like a demon or something, like trying to like make you unless play you're with them Paranormal or... Activity three or no 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 <laughs> uh, the Conjuring three where the demon was an old man. Oh yeah. So old Bill in his chair. I guess there's something unsettling about elder people elderly people well and young no people. it's like a bell Both. curve it's a bell curve so paranormal investigators often report shadow figures electromagnetic field spikes or emf spikes um you know they do all those kinds of a bunch more probably i'm assuming 
But basically, the property was purchased in 2007 by Joe Jordan, who started to preserve and restore the asylum. The site was renamed the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. I guess it was named something else for a time when they were trying to it probably went, rebrand. It went from the Weston State Hospital uh, to that. To, to something this, else, to yeah. That. So I guess she renamed it that to kind of give it its creepy paranormal feel. Well, no, I think that's yeah, just probably. the proper name for it. That was what it was used for the most. Yeah, I guess. Oh my gosh, for a ghost hunt at the Trans Elegant, it's $100 a person. They saw you coming. Oh my gosh. Oh, wait, but you get to spend the night. Our ghost hunt lasts from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., Oh my oh, god. I'd be so tired. That's kind of scary. Um so after a brief paranormal tour you might may either hunt alone or with our experienced ghost hunting guides. That's kind of crazy that you could do it alone. Like that's kind of scary. I they guess. trust you. They probably monitor yeah. it though. All those yeah. fun places have so many security do you think cameras. That they like fake things or do you think they just kind of like let you That go? would be a good gag. That wouldn't That's like so cheap though. Well, you just need one disgruntled employee. Mm. to tell on you but if they're keeping their employees on campus like they did when it was an institution they then still you could, don't let you anyone could probably leave. have a good thing going eight hour public oh another hundred dollar per person there's the ghost hunt the medical forensics and geriatric buildings oh man that's where you're gonna get some weird the geriatric building yeah sorry old folks we're coming for you now i'll tell you something is that are they all at unreasonable hours yeah 9 p.m to 5 a.m oh. and the private ghost tours you will be released at 5 a.m as well Two hundred and fifty dollars a person. Oh my god! Can, why can't they just have like a nine to midnight, nine p.m. to midnight, or eight p.m. to midnight? We'll watch the sunset. They're probably anticipating nothing to happen for a certain amount of those hours in order for you know, like, oh, we tried till five. We might as well, you know, call quits. This article was released in twenty eighteen, and someone, the title is, "I spent the night in a haunted asylum, and I still can't explain what I saw." Let's, let's explain it Whoa. in five minutes. Okay, Come on, wait, try me. me. Oh, a girl named Lily was born at the asylum and her ghost is said to play there still. That's kind of weird. Yeah. Um, so she said they try the flashlight trick again and again, I guess, to like turn on. I don't know. In a room where Lily supposedly plays in a pitch black corridor once were reserved for violent women in a lobotomy recovering area. <laughs> okay, this Reddit post is from r slash paranormal and it's written by a paranormal tour guide at the Trans Allegheny Asylum. So she writes, In 2021, I retired from my position as a guide and ghost hunt event manager under severe burnout. After all that I experienced there, it solidified in my mind that paranormal things that defy rational explanation do indeed happen. And certain phenomena are absolutely real, like electronic voice phenomenon. It's almost October and I'm feeling a little spooky, so here are a couple of strange things I experienced in my time there. One evening while training for the job, I was on the first floor with a couple of coworkers while everyone else was touring upstairs. We were just kind of killing time, quietly observing the area. Light from outside was coming in through the windows, casting on the inner hall's wall. In that light, I watched the perfect silhouette of a man from head to hip walk through that light from left to right. I said something about it, and the three of us watched as an arm and hand moved into the light from the right side. I immediately ran into the room and began looking out of that window for someone outside. There was no one there at the time. The realization that from the ground to the bottom of the window is like seven feet didn't even occur to me i will never forget the crisp clear silhouette shape for as long as i live we would run experiments with the spirit box it rapidly scans radio frequencies and are believed to be a communication device one person would use one with noise canceling earbuds all they are able to hear is the radio static and blips of a few random stations that would like be so unpleasant i know <laughs> We have a spirit box. We do it on live sometimes. It is unpleasant to listen to, let yeah. alone in sound, like Bose headphones. Oh, my ears. And like in the dark and in an asylum, uh, <laughs> abandoned one or whatever. Uh, retired one, I guess. <laughs> Um, the geriatric building <laughs> be like okay when they hear a word or phrase they are to say it out loud i always like this role in the experiment one evening my coworker and i ran one of these experiments in a t notorious room where a murder in 1987 took place for 10 minutes i sat and listened to nothing but radio static through the spirit box no blips of radio nothing except ch -ch 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 of the static lol i was starting to get bored when i heard a woman's voice say evil so i spoke up and repeated the word evil next thing i know my Coworker is shining her flashlight in my face to get my attention. I pull out the earbud and she was practically frantic 
frantic saying, it's time to go, time to go. So we haul ass out of the room, down the hall, down the next hall to the center section before she would even tell me what happened. While I was hearing nothing but static, she said she kept hearing what sounded like someone shuffling their feet and walking around just outside the door. She said she spoke up and asked whoever is out in the hallway, are they nice? That was when I spoke out and said evil. So, like, Uh. oh, we should do that where one of us can't hear the like the questions that they're asking yeah i then realized we're biased I think, yeah yeah okay in the wee hours one night I, we figured it would be cool to see what would happen if we shut all the doors of the ward one of the doors as i was closing it the knob twisted in my hand i was not twisting the knob and was forcibly pulled closed i stood there for several moments opening slash closing that door trying to replicate what happened trying to explain it Finally, the person with me was like, what the hell are you doing? It was so weird. I'd never felt invisible force like that before. Had three people spend the night one night and they had thermal imaging video. They set it up, pointing down the hall where we would all watch on a tablet. We thought it would be interesting to leave a device at the far end of the hall that would alarm if the field around it was disturbed. As one of the dudes walked down the hall to put it there, we could see his form on thermal imaging, clearly human shaped in colors representing heat and warmth. When he walked by one of those doorways about a quarter way down the ward, the shape of a head, neck, shoulders, and upper body of a person in colors indicating cooler temperatures lean peeked out as he walked by. Like someone popped Uh, out of the room for a sec as he walked to check him out. I've never seen anything like that. Won't forget it and would give my left testicle if I had one for a copy of that footage. That happened a lot. A guest capturing something far out and not sending a copy to us. Oh, darn. That stinks. I'll end this long winded Reddit post with something that absolutely changed me and that I still don't understand. I remember the exact night and time of these occurrences. That's how profound and somewhat unsettling they were. June 3rd and June 4th of 2017, 3.40 a.m. June 3rd, after an hour or so of hearing a female's voice, one instance even sounded like she said my name, as well as banging around footsteps, literally running sounds on that hardwood floor toward us, I sat quietly on the floor with the group. I started to feel dizzy, lightheaded, and gross. I told myself it was my imagination and that I'd be fine. A few minutes later, I started to feel this intense burning sensation on my lower back, just to the right of my spine. Again, I told myself it was all just my imagination. The burning sensation kept amping up, getting worse and worse. I told myself that I didn't want to be that guy and say anything in front of these people. Finally, it got to the point where I had to say something. I asked my coworker with us if there was anything there. She was like, OMG, there on my lower back, just to the right of my spine, was a mark that looked like a burn or an abrasion about three to four inches long and about one inch wide. Now, I'd seen other such claims made by visitors of scratch marks and the like, often writing them off, and the marks were always gone within an hour at most. June 4th, same part of the building, same time of night because I just can't get enough, right? I noticed that my voice recorder ran out of memory, so I'm holding it in my right hand, using the flashlight in my left so I could see what I was doing. Suddenly, I feel a burning sensation on the underside of my right forearm and shifted my flashlight to it. The person beside me and I watched as three welts began to appear down my arm. Needless to say, that blew my mind. It is one thing to see marks like that. It is a whole ass other thing to watch it as it happens on your own skin. The majority of instances I've heard about, those marks were gone within 10 to 15 minutes. No lasting effects. Scared would be the wrong word, but I have none to describe my mind frame around those events. I took a week off from work after to try and process it all and was nervous being in that hallway for the rest of that summer. Like I said, I still don't know what to think or believe. I've got enough stories of experiences to probably fill a book, but I'll leave you with those for now. I will add a final note about how constantly poking around in the dark and talking about past true horrors of human experience day in and day out truly takes its toll spiritually and emotionally. Someone else commented on this that they went on a tour there about five years ago. They remember two things clearly that they encountered. One, we entered a room that was some kind of misbehaving room where two others murdered the roommate through hanging with the sheets or something. Ew. The second, I walked through the doorway. It was like walking through a sheet of frozen air in the middle of a hot summer day. And I knew something bad happened in the room before the guide told us about it. I whispered to my girlfriend that somebody died and she asked me how I knew afterwards. Second, at the end of the tour, we returned to the main entrance way by way of the long hallway on the left side. The guide had walked towards the entrance and my girlfriend and I both heard a bodiless whistle going back down the empty hallway we just came from. She completely denies it happened and says it was an employee. Later heard the exact same whistle in a video some ghost hunter show had recorded that had visited there. She still denies to this day that it could have been paranormal. It was whistling Willie. Yep. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into this episode of the Cauldron Convos podcast. Yes, as usual, make sure to subscribe, like, comment, anything down below. If you've been there, what other haunted places you want us to cover next time? Should we go there? What do you think? Or is that too much? 
Um, anyway. I think we should go. That'd be fun. We should go somewhere haunted. Yeah, we definitely should. Goof on them. But anyways, thanks again so much for watching, and we'll see you guys next time here on Cauldron Combos. Bye.